Good evening, everyone. That is a good level of excitement to start the evening here. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Lawrence Hall of Science tonight for our special evening symposium. This is part of a teacher workshop that one of our curriculum groups is doing this week. Those of you from the Bay Area may know the Lawrence Hall of Science for a science museum that serves children throughout the community. And we also have a great number of offices and staff downstairs who work hard to extend that beyond the Bay Area. So this is a workshop attracting teachers from across the country. And tonight, we're excited to have some people here from NASA and able to share some of the most recent findings of the Kepler mission. I am going to turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Andrew Fracknoy. You will know him from the AstroProf site that he has made available to you here. And you may have heard him speak in other engagements before. He's the Science Fridays, yes, on NPR. He is the chair of the astronomy department at Foothill College, and tonight he will be guiding us through our exploration of what is happening right now in what is quite possibly one of the most exciting missions going on today. So, thank you. Okay, so, to move the slides forward, I just push on the air. Okay, great. Let me get set up, and then we're ready to go. So, oh, I'm sorry you made it dark right away because I wanted to ask the uh, group some questions, but I can still do it. So how many of you are members of this uh, Teachers Institute? Raise your hand if you're part of the Teachers Institute. So for you, the quiz later will count. Um, and how many of you are coming here uh, from the public, from the outside, are not part of the... Excellent. So the publicity we did work. Um, how many of you are teachers? Amateur astronomers? Fans of astronomy? <laughs> how many of you were dragged here by a family member? <laughs> All right, good. We hope to make you fans of astronomy as we go along. And then finally, how many of you are from another planet? I see a number of the teachers raising their hand. Good. Well, we're delighted to see you here, whoever you are, and we have a fun evening planned. What we're going to do is we have three distinguished speakers. I will do a little setting of the scene. Then the speakers will each do about 20 minutes of introduction, and then we will constitute ourselves a panel. We'll sit here and we'll have discussion and questions and answers. We'll talk amongst ourselves and talk with you until we're all talked out. And the subject tonight is, as you heard, one of the most exciting uh, areas of modern astronomy, the search for other Earths, particularly other Earths, but also just in general, the search for planets elsewhere. Um, in 1993, no planets were known to circle stars like our own sun. As of today, only 20 years later, and I checked this today, so these are the actual numbers, we know 919 planets orbiting 708 other stars. And every indication is that this is only the tip of the cosmic iceberg. Planets may be more common than any of us science fiction fans had dared to hope. Um, so tonight we're going to show you how some of these discoveries came about and what they mean. Uh, for us who are fans of science fiction, of course, the big holy grail out there is not just planets, but life elsewhere, uh, whether E.T. Uh, is there or not. Some sort of life out there is what we hope to be able to establish eventually. Um, we've always dreamt about the possibility of life out there. We, of course, envision that life out there will be exactly like us, which may be a mistake. But it's certainly the topic that is called to most people's minds when we first hear about the discovery of planets. Even Time Magazine, not known as an especially scientifically oriented publication, as soon as we discovered the first couple of planets uh, around other stars, had this headline. 
how the discovery of two planets brings us closer to solving the most profound mystery of the cosmos, and what is that mystery? Is anybody out there? We like to say, looking at Washington, we still need to establish that there's any intelligent life in the universe. That's really what we're striving to do. Um, so I want to, as I say, set the scene because there are people here who are not fluent in astronomies. We astronomers generally divide the cosmos, the, the realms out there, into three specific realms. Uh, our local neighborhood, the city of stars we're part of, and then the larger sphere. So we begin with the solar system, the sun and its planets. Uh, depending on how you feel about Pluto, we have eight planets that circle the sun, or many more perhaps, but uh, these planets, uh, which are around our star, the sun, are known as the solar system. Sol is another word for sun, so the solar system is the sun's system. And this is our local neighborhood. This is where we begin all our exploration. But one of the things that we have learned in astronomy over the last few centuries is that this really is just one particular small neck of the woods in the larger picture. Uh, in the solar system, we have two kinds of planets. Actually, there are many more, but we generally tend to subdivide them into planets like the Earth, which we call terrestrial planets, Terra being another name for the Earth. Uh, another terrestrial planet may be familiar to you. This is a nice Hubble picture of Mars. And you can see Mars is a solid planet. If you land on it and you don't have the right retro rockets, you crash. And we've done that several times. Um, and you can see Mars with its polar cap at the bottom. Um, and we say that it is a terrestrial planet because it has scenery like the Earth. This is one of my favorite pictures from the rovers that are now exploring the surface of Mars uh, as our robot representatives. You can see a cliff face here leading to a giant crater and very much the solid makeup of Mars's surface. In contrast with Earth and Mars, we have another kind of planet in the solar system, which we call a gas or liquid planet. And here's my favorite among the four that we have. This is Saturn with the familiar ring to it. Uh, by the way, Saturn doesn't have a hole in the upper right. That's the shadow of Saturn cast on its own rings. But Saturn is actually a planet where if you tried to land, you wouldn't. You just sink in and in and in like a giant ocean. Um, it's made mostly of gas and liquid. And actually, on average, Saturn is lighter than water. In other words, if you had a bathtub big enough, Saturn would float. <laughs> of course, imagine the ring it would leave. No, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. OK, moving quickly onward. So that's our local neighborhood. Then we move out into the larger area, just like every family lives in a home. But then as kids grow up, they realize that their own home is not the only building, not the only home in their uh, city. So we have a city of stars that we're part of, which we call the Milky Way Galaxy. And here's a diagram right from the Kepler mission showing you an artist's conception of the Milky Way Galaxy, um, roughly a, a couple of hundred billion stars like the sun couple of hundred billion suns make up the Milky Way galaxy. And in a small part of that galaxy, shown by the yellow cone that you see there, we are searching for planets with the Kepler mission. And that's why whatever we find and whatever we'll talk about today can be multiplied to a much larger picture, because our sample is such a small one in the cosmic scheme of things. So among the billions and billions of stars in the Milky Way, the question has always been, are there stars like the sun with planets? Um, we know that new stars are forming all the time. This is a beautiful Hubble picture of a star forming region. You see the jewel box of blue stars in the middle of what looks like a jaw of a di giant dinosaur. You see the giant dinosaur jaws? That's actually a womb of, uh, that, had, uh, that gave birth to the jewel box of stars in the middle. And the adolescent energy from those stars is pushing aside 
the raw material that had given birth to them. And so we see the jaws opening up as these bright adolescent stars shine their little hearts out. Um, but we see from such images that new stars and new planets are still forming uh, throughout our galaxy and others. And then the, more, the, the latest discovery of astronomy is that, in fact, we have not just our galaxy of stars, but other galaxies, other great cities of stars as far as our eyes and telescopes can take us. There are billions of other systems like the Milky Way, each of them with billions of other stars. So the number of places where we can look for planets and perhaps life in the universe is beyond imagining. And it's in that vast realm, but mostly in our local neighborhood of the Milky Way, that we have begun to search for the question, for the uh, possibility of planets around other stars. And for many of us who are in astronomy and many of you who are fans of astronomy, this is in fact the big discovery of the last 15 years. Few things match this in terms of excitement of, of new discoveries and new ideas coming all the time. Now why has it taken us so long to find planets around other stars? And the quick answer is stars are bright, planets are dim. The stars shine, making their own energy, and they're brilliant lights in the, on the cosmic scene. In fact, stars remind me a lot of giant searchlights. Now, if you're an amateur astronomer, there's nothing more annoying than this kind of shopping center opening light shining into the sky, right? It ruins the entire evening if you want to see anything in the actual sky. But just bear with me for this analogy, even if this disgusts you. Um, if, if you look, if you think of a star as a giant spotlight like this, then if there are planets orbiting that star, those planets don't have any visible light shine of their own. If we see planets like Venus and Mars in the sky, it's only because those planets reflect sunlight, reflect starlight. And so we see these planets, which are much smaller than stars, only because of the reflected light they give off. So in a very rough way, if a star is like one of these incredibly obnoxious searchlights, then a planet orbiting it might be a mosquito with an oily belly flying around the spotlight and reflecting a little bit of its light. Imagine now that you're coming in for a landing at San Francisco airport and looking down on one of these shopping center opening lights, and there around it is a mosquito with its oily belly reflecting a little bit of light. Any chance from the airplane you're going to be able to see the mosquito? Nah, right? The light is so bright, and the mosquito, even if you could see it, would be lost in the glare of that giant spotlight. There's no chance that you're going to be able to see the mosquito. What we mostly see are the stars. So how have we found planets around other stars? Um, here you see a picture of our own sun seen from a theoretical planet uh, 33 light years away with a telescope that can really follow the motion of our sun. And you can see that the sun is not sitting still as seen from this other star. It's actually wiggling and wobbling. Why is the sun wiggling and wobbling from this distant perspective? Because it's being pulled by the planets that orbit it, particularly the big planets. If a planet like Jupiter, here's Jupiter, here's the sun, right? Jupiter's gravity will pull slightly on the sun. Now the sun is a big mass of stuff and Jupiter's just a little planet, so the pull of Jupiter on the sun is not going to be very great, but it's there. And when Jupiter goes around to the other side, Jupiter will pull the other way on the star. And so the star will show a little bit of wiggling back and forth as a big planet orbits it. And the first way we have found out about the existence of planets elsewhere is by this wiggle and wobble method. We found out that there are planets orbiting other stars which have enough gravity to pull those stars a little bit to one side and then the other. And we have techniques for discovering the motion of stars through observing their light. And which planets will be best at wiggling their stars? Planets that are big, that have a lot of mass, 
and planets that are close to their stars. So the first class of planets we discovered were big fat planets close to their stars. Jupiters that orbit their stars may be in a couple of days, three, four, five, ten days. That was a big surprise. We didn't expect that anything like a Jupiter could survive near a star so close that it only takes a few days to orbit. I'll remind you that the closest planet in the solar system, Mercury, takes 88 days to orbit, and it's an almost molten slag heap of heavy metal. Rock and roll fans take note, that's the heavy metal planet uh, Mercury is, right? And so a planet like Jupiter made mostly of gas and liquid, no self-respecting Jupiter should be able to exist closer to its star than, Ju than Mercury is in our solar system. But indeed, we did find such hot Jupiters because that's what our technique of looking for the wiggles identified best. Not only did we find one planet around these stars, but sometimes we were able to find several planets. Here's the Upsilon Andromedae system showing you several planets uh, around other stars, around another star system. And today, um, we've actually found 142 stars with more than one planet, some with six or seven planets in the same system. So we're making good progress in searching for not just planets, but planetary systems. And then the other method, which you'll hear more about in the next talk, that we've discovered also works with these faint planets, is if you could watch a planet go across the face of its star as seen from Earth. Astronomers call this a transit. And when the planet goes across the face of its star, its dark sphere cuts out a tiny bit of the light. Only a tiny, tiny bit. But as you'll hear, we have instruments in space so sensitive that even this tiny bit of missing light can show up in those instruments and tell us each time a planet eclipses or transits its parent star. And that's the method that the Kepler folks are using. Um, occasionally, we can even detect a planet directly. Now, I just told you about the mosquito analogy, so how can we see a planet directly? Well, if the planet is really far away from its star, and we put something in front of the star, oh, I'll skip that. If we put something in front of the star, like here they put a black plate in front of the Hubble's view of the nearby star, Fomalot, and they discover that far away, much further from the star Fomalot than Pluto is, there is a planet, and you can see the orbit in the inset in the upper right of this little planet going around the bright star Fomalot. Why were we able to see it? Because this planet is so far away, it takes 2,000 years to orbit its star. Now, Pluto takes about 250 years, so 2,000 years is really a ridiculous amount of time for a planet to go around. But that means it's so far that it's away from the bright light of the star, and we have a better chance of picking it up. There are other, other circumstances as well. But so I've now told you about planets so close that they hug their star. I've told you about planets so far away, they take millennia to go around their star. We certainly have an amazing variety of planets that these methods and others have helped us to discover. So now we move on to the actual Kepler discoveries, and I'm going to introduce the panel of scientists one by one. They're going to come up and do some introductory material, and then we'll go on from there. So let me begin uh, to move on to the actual Kepler discoveries by introducing Natalie Battaglia. Uh, Dr. Battaglia is the Kepler mission scientist. She works at NASA Ames. She's a research astronomer there as well, and is on leave from San Jose State, where she was a popular teacher when she was there. But I think many of you may know Dr. Battaglia not just for her scientific work, but for her public outreach work. In many ways, she is the public voice of the Kepler mission. If you've seen, if you've Googled the Kepler mission, if you've seen talks or television shows about the Kepler mission, it's her articulate explanations that are most commonly available. So it's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce to you the Kepler mission scientist, Dr. Natalie Battaglia. All right, I think we're ready. 
Um, thank you so much for coming, first of all, to share the, the moment with us and um, hear about all this great science that's happening, a lot of which is happening right here in our beloved Bay Area, um, something you should be very proud of, right? Um, so the title of my talk is A Planet for Goldilocks because humanity is on a quest to find life beyond Earth. And I'm not being fanciful. And uh, it's not a talk about science fiction. <laughs> we really are at a crossroads where this is going to be possible. We have more or less the road map to do it. Might not happen in my lifetime or maybe even in my daughter's lifetime, but certainly within a few generations, I think it's very likely that we will find, or not, um, if it doesn't exist, but uh, evidence of life beyond Earth. And I think we're going to get a positive result. So there's kind of three ways to approach that. Uh, you can explore the solar system, right? People have talked about maybe odd places in the solar system, little niches where life might thrive. Uh, for example, underneath the ice layers of uh, Europa or Enceladus, one of the outer satellites of uh, one of the satellites of the outer planets. Uh, maybe Mars has fossils. It used to have surface water. Maybe it has fossils, right? So solar ex solar system exploration is one pathway. Um, SETI, like a SETI search, is another pathway where you train a radi radio telescope out in space listening for signals that are not due to any natural source as we might know it, something that could be due to technology like we have here on Earth. Um, but the third method is really taking center stage recently because of the plethora of planet detections that we've had over the last few years. And the idea is basically, well, we've got all of these worlds out there. Can we find worlds that are like ours in many ways? Can we find a planet literally for Goldilocks, right? Something that is just right for life, at least as we know it here on Earth. And so by doing so, we are really zeroing in on the potential cradles for life looking for habitable environments, potentially habitable environments, and thinking of experiments that we could do following up those discoveries to, to see if there are signatures of life, all right? And, and you're gonna hear about that as well. So, we must begin with a fairy tale. Once upon a time, uh, in a deep, dark forest, there was a little girl named Goldilocks. And she stumbled upon a house in the middle of that forest, and it was warm and inviting, and she couldn't resist but to go inside. And so hungry she was from her walking, she went into the kitchen and found three bowls of porridge. One was too hot, one was too cold, but one was just right, and she ate every last drop. So tired she was from her walking and her eating, she decided to go sit down for a rest. And in the parlor, she found three chairs. One was too soft, one was too hard, but one was just right. And she rocked and rocked and rocked and rocked until that chair crumbled. Still tired from her wandering, she went into the bedroom and saw three nice beds, but one was too hard, one was too soft, but the other was just right, and she fell fast asleep into a deep slumber. Well, we know the ending of that fairy tale, right? Goldilocks ran home that day and maybe learned some lessons about trespassing. Um, <laughs> But when I was a child, I was really impressed by the Goldilocks fairy tale. Uh, not, maybe I didn't get the moral of the story, but I was impressed that a little girl like Goldilocks would go into the forest at all. And it resonated with me because I, as a kid, also liked to explore. Uh, well, Goldilocks has grown up. <laughs> and uh, the forest now is the entire galaxy, really, the entire universe. And this cosmic forest beckons. And, and we're now looking for a planet that is, that is just right, that is something that we would recognize as, as home in many regards. Um, so Goldilocks is looking at this plethora of planets that we've found recently over the years and wondering, gosh, which one of these is like home? Well, if, if a planet is too big, like a Jupiter, um, it's going to very efficiently glob on a lot of the primordial hydrogen that is in the solar nebula when our star formed. If a planet is too small, it's not going to have enough gravity to hold on 
to these light elements that then create a, a warm atmosphere that stabilizes the temperature and gives rise to life. Um, so there's kind of a just right size, if you will. Uh, not too big and not too small. Likewise, there's a just right temperature because we know in our own, on our own planet, no matter where we look, there seems to be life, no matter how extreme the environment, in the coldest places, the hottest places, uh, dry places, places with no oxygen, places that are acidic or have a high salinity, all of these nooks and crannies on Earth have life because life seems to be very creative, prolific, robust. But one thing that all life on Earth has in common is that it's carbon-based. And carbon-based carbon chemistry, as we understand it, requires liquid water as the solvent that facilitates all these important chemical reactions for life, like metabolism. So if a planet is too hot, all of that precious water will boil away. If the planet is too cold, that precious water will be locked up as ice. And so you want that sweet spot where you get just enough energy from the star that liquid water has the potential to pool on the surface and therefore create conditions for life. So this is our, our very simplest definition of the Goldilocks zone in terms of planets. Um, something that's about the right size, about the size of Earth, and is getting about the right energy from the star. Now, finding such planets is a real challenge, and you've already heard some reasons why that is. You know, planets are tiny. Here's a schematic that shows the relative sizes of the sun and our planets. And, and these planets, these tiny little balls, the two largest ones being Jupiter and Saturn, are really almost like an afterthought, right? This is the debris, this is the junk, this is the stuff my mom would sweep out of the house, right? It's, it's nothing. Um, so these things are tiny and they are very spread out. Uh, if the sun were the size of a basketball, this Jupiter here would be about the size of a, a bouncy ball. The Earth would be maybe a half of a grain of, of rice. Earth would be maybe 100 feet away. Uh, Jupiter's going to be more like a football field, more than a football field away, one or two football fields away. So space is vast and the planets are small. Um, and, and as Andy mentioned, the, the planets are lost in the glare of the parent star. My analogy is, is a lighthouse. Um, if you can imagine a lighthouse, uh, it's, it's going to overwhelm the brightness. In fact, the brightness of the star compared to the brightness that's reflected off of the surface of a planet like Earth is about 10 billion to one. So it's like trying to find the firefly that you, that you know is there but is lost in the glare of, of that spotlight, literally. So it's a very challenging problem. Um, some hundreds of planets had been discovered before this mission, Kepler, that I'm here to tell you about today, even launched. And the very large majority of, the, of those planets were discovered by this wobble method that Andy described, uh, whereby a star and a planet orbits about their common center of mass. Right? Um, and that common center of mass is not going to be right in the center of the star, it's gonna be offset a little bit. And that's the point about which they both orbit. So this wobble method produced most of the discoveries in 2009 when Kepler launched. And here's a cartoon from XKCD. Do you guys know XKCD? A few people. Okay, good. Um, it's a very popular cartoon site amongst the science community. Um, every circle that you see here is a planet discovery as of, um, actually as of last June, 2012. Um, it does not include a lot of Kepler's discoveries, however. Um, what, what I want you to notice by looking at this cartoon is that the balls are all to scale, okay? And more importantly, in the very center of that cartoon is a group of circles with a gray box behind it. Can you guys see it? Those are our solar system planets, and perhaps the only two circles that you can see are Jupiter and Saturn, the largest. So if you scan your eye over this cartoon, you'll see very easily that the large majority of the discoveries that had been made are even larger than Jupiter and Saturn. And those are not the planets that we're chasing after. We are trying to find the Goldilocks planets that are about the size of Earth, okay? Um, so that's where the Kepler mission enters. In 2001, the NASA decided to fund this idea to build this spacecraft that would have the sensitivity to find potentially habitable Earth-sized planets, Goldilocks planets. 
And Kepler's job is to do one very, very simple thing. It really just needs to calculate one number that is a number that's required for this, for this as a milestone on this road to detecting life beyond Earth. And this number is the fraction of stars in our galaxy that harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets. Is it 10%, 15%, 50%, 200%? That is, does every star have two? I don't know. And I can't build a spacecraft to go out and find life until I know the answer to that question. I need to know what is the prevalence of Earth-like planets in our galaxy. Okay? All right. So in 2009, eight years later after it was selected, yay. successful launch, March of 2009 at Cape Canaveral in Florida. The science team was there, Gabor was there. Um, Kepler is uh, outside of the Earth's gravity well. It's actually orbiting the sun, but in an orbit very much like our own Earth's. Uh, it's a space-based telescope. The mirror is about one meter across in diameter compared to Hubble, which is a, a little over two. Um, it stares at one part of the sky, the Summer Triangle, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Uh, we've got the Kepler field of view right underneath the wing of Cygnus the Swan between Deneb and Vega is that mosaic of squares which are Kepler's detectors projected onto the sky. And here they are, a mosaic of silicon that's collecting light. The light is falling on it. And these devices are measuring voltages every time a, a, a light photon lands on it. About a month after we launched, we, we ejected the dust cover and got back our very first light image, and this is it. This is what it looked like. Um, and every single tiny dot that you see on it is a star in our own galaxy. In this one piece of sky about the size of my hand, there are four and a half million stars captured in our galaxy alone. So many, many stars to choose from. Uh, we are targeting about 150,000 of them looking for planets. So we've chosen 150,000 stars that are very much like our own sun from this large sample of stars. So how are we finding these planets? Well, Andy mentioned the transit method. Kepler is just staring at this one patch of sky, and it's hoping that some of these stars are going to be aligned so that the orbits of the planets are passing directly between the disk of the star and the telescope. So in that configuration, that rocky body is casting a shadow out into the galaxy that sweeps across our telescope. And the pixels on these detectors then measure a change in brightness, a momentary dimming of light. And this is what the data actually looks like. This is real data. Those, that's the pixelated data. Each square is a voltage that tells us something about the amount of light that fell on it. So what we actually get when we do a little bit of computer manipulation is a brightness measurement for a given time for a star. And when a planet transits across it, the brightness, which is the green trace as a function of time, will suddenly blink out. It will decrease, right? due to the, the eclipse um, that that planet made. And so that green trace is literally what we are measuring, what we bring down. We bring down these uh, voltage measurements on these pixels and we turn those into a brightness measurement for every star and we measure the brightness every 30 minutes without blinking for years waiting for this tiny dimming of light that's gonna happen for an Earth-like planet once a year and last 12 hours. All right, so you have to be patient, you have to do this consistently, you have to have stability. So even though the science is very simple, the technology uh, is really in, the magic is in the technology that allows us, affords us the stability to see these tiny changes in brightness and be consistent. Um, the amount of dimming, therefore, tells us something about the size of the planet, right? And here's a cartoon of the sun with a Jupiter. Jupiter is going to block out about 1% of the light, right? If the planet is tinier, it blocks out less light, and so the amount of dimming is less. You measure the amount of dimming, you get the size of the planet. That's one of Goldilocks criteria, right? Here's what an Earth-sized planet looks like. Yeah, it takes, you can barely see it there, right? It's this tiny little speck. It takes out one part per 10,000. 
And so to, for the teachers in the audience, if you're trying to get this point across to the kids, you know, tell them, imagine the tallest hotel you've ever seen in like downtown San Francisco or, or New York, you know, a building that's like 30, 40 stories high and every single room is occupied and it's nighttime, everybody has the light turned on in that hotel. So it's brilliant at night, every window's lit up, and one person in that hotel walks over to the window and lowers the blinds by about two centimeters. That's the change in brightness that we have to measure. So, so we get the size by the amount of dimming. The other thing that we can measure is the orbital period. How long, what is the time interval between these little blinks, between the transit events, right? That tells you how long it takes for the planet to go around once. Orbital period. Well, Johannes Kepler, our namesake, uh, about 400 years ago told us, discovered the empirical laws of orbital motion that says that this orbital period is directly related to the distance between the star and the planet. And if I know the distance between the star and the planet, uh, I know what the energy budget is. I know how far we're standing away from the campfire. Therefore, I know how hot my hands are going to get, right? So amount of dimming tells us the size. The time it takes to complete an orbit tells us how far away it is from the star. And this tells us if it's, if it's habitable. There's Goldilocks smiling at all of these green shaded zones, which is her Goldilocks zone, where the energy balances is just right for, the, for liquid water potentially to pool on the surface. Okay? And you can see it depends on the star type. Some campfires are really bright. Some campfires are very dim and you have to cozy up next to them to get the same energy, right? So it depends on the star type too. All right, I'd like to show you now, I'd like to give you the bird's eye view of what Kepler has discovered so far since that day in 2009 when we sat there and stood there in Florida and watched it launch. Um, and I'm going to do this with a scatter plot. On the y-axis, is the size of the planet. And on the x-axis is the orbital period, these two things that we measure. And I put in some horizontal lines to guide your eye. I put a horizontal line at Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter. So planets that are, are points, every point, like that pink one that's in this diagram represents one planet discovery, okay? If it's up at the top, it means it's a big planet. If it's this way to the left, it means it's very close to its star because it's orbiting very quickly, okay, a short orbital period. And so I'm going to step you through the discoveries, um, not just ours, but I'm going to start with the very first discovery of an exoplanet, a planet orbiting another star around a, nor uh, around a normal star. And that was uh, 51 peg B is that pink point. That was done in 1995 by uh, Michelle Mayor from uh, the Swiss team. And you can see that that pink point is very near to Jupiter sizes and at very short orbital periods. In fact, it had an orbital period of about three days. Only took three days to go around its star once. So that was in 1995, and now I'm going to tick it forward and add some other points. Many more pink points, but in 2001 we got our very first blue point which was the discovery of an exoplanet from the transit method, not from Kepler, but from ground-based telescopes. And so this is what the scene looked like in 2009, right before Kepler launched. You had this cluster of pink points, this pink cloud in the upper right, Jupiter-sized planets out at hundreds of days orbital period. You had had another cluster of blue points that were also Jupiter-sized and at very short orbital periods, and those tended to be the transiting planets. The others were the wobble planets. So this is what it looked like. And um, so now I'm going to tick it forward again without the Kepler discoveries. I'm going to add the discoveries that were made between 2009 and today. And you'll see that most of them are, are more pink points. The radial velocity, or this wobble method that I told you about, is getting more and more sensitive. Um, so you're starting to see kind of Neptune-ish sized planets. Um, but now I'm going to show you with a yellow color the discoveries that Kepler has made over the last, well, since we launched in 2009, but only after analyzing the first two years of data. We've got four years of data. This represents half of that data. This is what Kepler has added to the plot. 
<laughs> Taxpayer money really well spent, right? Um, every time you have a new piece of technology like this, it opens new windows, right? It really, you make leaps. You make grand strides, and that's what Kepler has done. It's really transformed the field of exoplanets altogether. And you can see that the distribution or where these points are swarming looks really different. Whereas before Kepler, 80% or 85% of the discoveries were larger than Neptune. With Kepler, 85% of them are smaller than Neptune. So it was really just a matter of sensitivity. We needed that extra sensitivity to find a Goldilocks planet. Right? Okay, so I'd like to now show you um, just a few of the worlds that have kind of started to take on a personality uh, because we know something about them, right? We've, we've followed them up with other telescopes. We've maybe gotten a mass. Uh, so now that we've got, we've got a radius and, and we've got the orbital period, so now we know how far away it is. And, and then maybe we did some observations with a Keck telescope to get a mass or we learned other things about them. Um, but the way I'm going to show it to you is through the artistry of, 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 of these, these artists that take the knowledge that we have amassed and make something really come alive. And the reason we're doing this is because our data is pixelized, right? Upper left-hand corner, that's the equivalent of our Hubble image, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we're not going to... In, in create imagination uh, with those pixelated images. We take that data though, we add up those voltages and we create a brightness measurement, right? So in the middle plot, that is equivalent to the green cartoon that you saw earlier. Every white point is a brightness measurement. And this is the dimming that you see from a planet that is about 40% larger than our planet Earth. And so we, we give that information to the artists, everything that we know, and they create something like what you see in the bottom right-hand corner, some kind of an image. Um, so the first world that I'd like to tell you about is a planet that is about 40% larger than Earth, but it's orbiting 23 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our own sun. It's a blow-torched world. The star-facing side has temperatures in excess of that required to melt uh, iron. So it's a blowtorched world. Um, but we know that it's a rocky world because we have its mass and its radius. We can compute mass divided by volume, which is density. And we know that this is a planet you could actually stand on. It's humanity's first unequivocal discovery of a rocky planet orbiting another star in our galaxy. Um, this planet, 40% larger than Earth, has an ocean on one hemisphere, an ocean that's larger than the Pacific, but it's an ocean not of water, it's an ocean of lava because it's so hot, so it's a very extreme world. We have also seen planets that have uh, two sunrises and sunsets, thereby proving that George Lucas was right. <laughs> that was very exciting, um, analogous to uh, Luke Skywalker's home world, Tatooine. And so these are called circumbinary planets because they orbit binary stars. Two stars gravitationally bound orbiting around their common center of mass and someplace far away there is a planet orbiting around the whole system. So not only do you see two stars rising and setting, you see them switching places in the sky doing this nice pas de deux as they orbit their common center of mass. Very exciting. Um, we also see planets orbiting stars that are gravitationally bound in clusters, um, open clusters like the Pleiades star cluster, but further away. Um, we now know that planets can exist in an environment like that. If you were to look up at the sky, the density of bright orbs in the sky is going to look quite different than it looks here on, on Earth. And it shows that these kinds of planets can exist in environments that we thought were very extreme, very improbable for worlds to happen, to, to survive. We have found worlds that are just the right size. Goldilocks was so happy, except that they were much too hot. An example of this is Kepler 20, E and F, one slightly smaller than the Earth, one slightly larger than Venus, but orbiting with orbital periods of about seven and 20 days, not 365 like our own Earth. So again, like Kepler 10b, these are blowtorched worlds. We also have planets that are just the right temperature 
but probably too large. This is Kepler 22b in comparison with our own blue marble, planet Earth. You see that it's about 2.4 times the size of our planet Earth. And the media loves to call these things super Earths, right? They're in folks' images of like this huge planet, rocky, lots of real estate. Um, but in fact, we, we believe that this is more like a mini Neptune. Yeah, there's a big difference, right? Super Earth, mini Neptune. Mini Neptune is quite different. Mini Neptune is something that's going to have this gaseous or ice envelope of these hydrogen-rich molecules, uh, not a solid surface like we're, we're, like we're aiming for. So... Um, but the jury is out on that, but it's just the right temperature. Um, most recently, we have found the Kepler-62 system, which is a world in the habitable zone of a star that's a K-type star about 1,200 light years away. It actually has indication of five independent planets, five planets each producing its own sequence of dimmings and uh, periodic dimmings, and two of those, Kepler-62e at 122 days and Kepler-62f at 267 days are in this just right zone. And they are 40% larger than the Earth and 60% larger than the Earth. I, actually, the reverse. Kepler 62e, which is on the inner edge of this green shaded region, is about 60% larger than the Earth, and Kepler 62f, which is right in the middle, is only 40% larger than Earth. And remember, Kepler 10b, our lava world, we know is a rocky planet. So this is very likely to be a rocky planet, a true super Earth with lots of real estate, smack in the middle of the habitable zone of a K-type star. OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about statistics. This is the other graphic I'm going to show you. Um, this is a bar chart. So we've got all these numbers, right? We've got hundreds and hundreds of planet discoveries. In fact, that graphic, I didn't tell you, had 3,300 discoveries in it. So, you know, we spoke of, Andy spoke of 900 new worlds. I spoke in the beginning of about 700 new worlds. Kepler has identified over 3,000, actually now, as of a couple weeks ago, over 3,500 new worlds orbiting other stars. Um, so what do you do with these numbers? Okay, we've got like 3,000 new worlds and we were monitoring 150,000 stars. So what percent, is that like 2%? You know, can I take 3,000 and divide it by 150,000 and get like 2% or something? Is, does that mean that only 2% of stars actually have planets? And the answer is no, not at all. Remember, stars out in the galaxy are not, they're, they're all randomly oriented. The orbital plane of their planetary systems are not necessarily going to all be in line and transiting. In fact, the probability of that happening is really small. It's like a half of a percent. Now, the question is, for Goldilocks, how many of those are in the habitable zone? Is there anything we can say about planets in the habitable zone with two years of data? And that's really tough, because our own Earth, the very planet that we're trying to simulate or find that we're searching for, um, has an orbital period of a year. So we need more data in order to be able to find these repetitive blinks of that true Earth analog that we're looking for. Nevertheless, there are stars out there much smaller. There are many weaker campfires out there. Our own star is that G-type star. Right? But the most abundant star in the galaxy, in fact, in the solar neighborhood, over 70% of the stars are not Gs. They're not As or Bs or Os. They're the tiny little Ms. Those are the most prevalent star in our galaxy. And those are weak campfires. The habitable zone is going to be cozied up right next to it, very short orbital periods. In fact, the orbital period of a planet in the habitable zone of an M-type star is going to be weeks, maybe a month, not years. So we can start to say something about the prevalence of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone around M-type stars. And so I'm going to finish by doing a thought experiment. If you took um, the, the galaxy, we're going to ask the question, how close is the nearest potentially habitable Earth-sized planet likely to be? 
Given these statistics, if you took the galaxy and you scaled it to the size of the continental US, and you stood there in San Francisco, right, right on the ocean over by Golden Gate Park, right, at the ocean, ocean beach, you stood there and you gazed to the east looking across the continental United States and you asked yourself, where is the next likely habitable planet expected to be? It's going to be, according to these statistics of M-type stars, uh, uh, just a stroll across the park. <laughs> or about 15 light years, okay? So this is an extremely exciting, tantalizing indication um, that planets like Earth are going to be um, abundant in the galaxy. Uh, if there's time afterwards, I'd be happy to talk to you about the what, what the next steps are towards finding a true, not just a planet in the habitable zone, but a planet that is a habitable environment. We'll t I'm sure Tori will talk about that, and I can talk about, in terms of missions, what the next step is. Um, Some place out there is a Goldilocks, and the cosmic forest beckons. And so someplace out there, there's a Goldilocks that's going to take us there. So I'll end on that note, and thank you very much.